Welcome, everybody. We're glad you're here. Good to see so many friends on here. Um, this is uh, Conversations Beyond the Walls, a virtual symposium, and tonight's topic is Heart Mountain Barracks Revisited. Um, this project originated from the American Studies Program at the University of Wyoming and the UW Art Museum as a series of talks, presentations, and art activations held in conjunction with the exhibition Moving Walls, Heart Mountain Barracks in the Bighorn Basin from the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation, which is now on view at the Art Museum. So I highly recommend you stop in and see these photos in person. Um, the goal of this series is to honor the history of Japanese American peoples incarcerated by the US government in Wyoming and beyond during World War II and to integrate arts with complex cultural issues. In doing so, we hope to use a historical event to address contemporary narratives such as global human migrations, displacement of peoples, power and control, empathy and belonging, homesteading, resiliency, diversity, and social justice issues of today. Before we begin, we feel compelled to acknowledge that in Laramie, we, are current, we currently occupy the indigenous ancestral land of the Arapaho, Shoshone, Cheyenne, and Crow people, among other native tribes that call the Great Basin and Rocky Mountain regions home. In doing so at this event, we affirm that the autonomy and well being of indigenous peoples must remain central to all efforts towards justice and equity. We encourage safe and respectful language be used in discussions, self reflection, and presence during the discussions and hope that these dialogues continue long after tonight. If you'd like to attend future events, please register by clicking on the link in the chat, which Katie is gonna post. Um, this speaker series continues every Thursday evening in October, so we'll hope you continue to join us. Uh, we would like to thank the many sponsors for this project. They include the UW American Heritage Center, the American Studies Program, the UW College of Law, the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation, UW's History Department, the Homesteader Museum in Powell, Wyoming, UW's Honors College, the Libraries, the School of Culture, Gender, and Social Justice, and the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research. Thanks to all of them for their generous support of various kinds. Uh, this evening's webinar format has both chat and Q&A functions. You'll see these buttons on the lower portion of your screen so you can chat throughout the evening. Comments, also put questions in there. If you'd like to ask a specific question, type it into the Q&A box and then we will um, hand those questions over to the panelists at the end of the, the presentation. Um, you can switch between gallery view and, and we can see all of the panelists or speaker view where they only see the current speaker. Although for the first part of this, we're gonna have a PowerPoint up. So probably you want to look at that. Um, so you can choose your own view. Um, if you need closed captions, there's a closed caption button at the bottom of the screen. And uh, thanks very much to Noelle Schatz for her assistance with that service. Uh, okay, let me introduce our panelists and we'll get started. Eric Sandin is Professor Emeritus of American Studies at the University of Wyoming and also the founding director of the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research. He has published widely on American visual culture, American landscapes, and public sites. For the last 20 years, he has been involved in the development of the Heart Mountain World War II Japanese American confinement site as a national historic landmark. He's currently a member of the board of director, directors of the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation, which is a group that consists of incarcerees, their descendants, scholars, and community members who are concerned not only with chronicling the World War II history of the site and its inhabitants, but also exploring the themes that emerge from this experience and continue to be important in the present day. Mary Humstone is an architectural historian and historic preservationist specializing in rural buildings and landscapes. From 2002 to 2014, she taught architectural history, historic preservation, and sustainability in the American Studies program at UW. She first came across Heart Mountain Barracks while teaching a field class on historic barns in the Powell area. She is a founding board member of the Alliance for Historic Wyoming, which is a statewide historic preservation advocacy organization. 
As director and curator, Rowene Weems spent 20 years at the Homesteader Museum in Powell, celebrating homesteading history. In her tenure there, the museum was honored with several Wyoming Historical Society awards for special exhibits and participated in three Smithsonian Museum on Main Street collaborations. She also created many educational activities, including annual events and historical bus tours, which helped bring the stories and the struggles of homesteading families back to life. Maureen recently retired, but continues to call Wyoming her home, although she's in Connecticut at the moment. <laughs> and I'm Andrea Graham. I'm a folklorist, a folk life specialist in the American Studies program at UW. And uh, I conduct field work statewide on traditional cultures and produce public programs and also teach a course in public sector cultural work. My research interests uh, focus on rural Western traditions and communities, particularly material and occupational culture and vernacular architecture. So that's our team. Um, we're gonna go ahead and get started with this evening's program, Heart Mountain Barracks Revisited. And I think Eric is going to start us off. Okay. Um, in the interest of saving time, why don't we just go to the PowerPoint and I'll, um, I'll introduce the subject through the slides. Okay. Cool. Okay, so I'm going to give the World War II history of the Heart Mountain site. Um, disgracefully short shrift tonight because our, our focus is on what happens after the war. But it's really important to, to recognize that um, Executive Order 9066 from February 1942 is the reason why Heart Mountain uh, existed at all. Uh, through this order, people, unspecified people, were to be removed from the West Coast and, sh and uh, relocated in the interior uh, in the name of national security. And immediately that was applied to the Japanese American and Japanese population on the West Coast. So the implementation of 9066 was racially inscribed from the get-go, and we have to recognize that. Next slide, please. So uh, people ended up in one of 10 uh, what were called relocation centers, or relocation camps, um, because they were the face of the enemy. They were not disloyal. Uh, they were distrusted. And so the history of uh, the Japanese Americans uh, during World War II um, had a lot to do with loyalty and um, allegiance um, and the feeling of having been discriminated against, which they obviously were. Um, about two thirds of the 120,000 people who were relocated to the interior were American citizens, by the way. And yet there were confined behind, behind barbed wire. Um, let's get to the barracks here. Next slide is a picture of the barracks under construction. Um, they were constructed in a big hurry. Um, and if you look carefully, I mean, you can see there that a, an entire wall is being raised by a crew while other crews are working on foundations or posts and whatever. Um, it looks like kind of like a tiny version of, of Levittown. And there, there's a way in which this kind of quick, quickly assembled uh, building uh, project uh, is a product of the war more generally and then implemented after the war in American suburbs. And, and, and you'll see later on, maybe some of these barracks are even inside post-World War II structures that look very much like suburban houses. Um, so next slide. During the war, this was the Heart Mountain site. Uh, realized that many of the people who ended up here came from climates that were vastly different from Wyoming. Um, so this was a privation on many different levels. And despite that, they formed a community in, uh, inside. Uh, next shot. Next slide, please. Inside a camp that was guarded uh, by soldiers in guard towers with searchlights behind barbed wire. That's not the end of the story. Um, that story is wonderfully chronicled at the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center. And I, I really uh, recommend that, that all of you who can go there between Cody and Powell and, and take in this wonderful museum display 
Um, but of course, that's not the end of the story. And, and we, we pick it up at the end of the war where the uh, Hard Mountain site, next slide, turns into a land settlement office where you could go and uh, pick up a couple of barracks if, if you were successful uh, in a lottery process and make the barracks part of your homestead. Um, and so the barracks, which had been the sites of incarceration during World War II, uh, became building blocks for a homesteading project that Rowena is going to describe to you. It's a very interesting project, next slide, that actually has a kind of drama to it where barracks were actually picked up on whatever trucks they could find or maybe disassembled and then moved to a spot, put down, uh, and then uh, they became the building blocks for communities in uh, the post-World War II Wyoming. And a lot of them are still there. And this is really interesting to me how they persist and are valued and have become part of very complex uh, operations. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, for example, um, this lambing shed, uh, if you know your barracks terminology, is very identifiable as, as, as a form of barrack. And, and here it is on a working uh, working ranch uh, between Cody and Powell, there are tens if not hundreds of barrack fragments still out there. Um, and it's really interesting to think about how the Hart Mountain Barrack still lives as a part of a community, a very different community from the one for which it was originally built, but nevertheless part of communities throughout the area. Um, in fact, as the interpretive center was being assembled, uh, my idea was to, to come up with a map uh, that would highlight how the Hart Mountain Barrack was still alive and part of uh, communities in Wyoming 70 years after the war. Um, barracks are important to the site itself. Next slide. So, for example, the, the reassembled barrack or the relocated barrack that is on the site today was brought from uh, Shell, Wyoming, uh, back to the, uh, the site and is now a part of the interpretation of the site. Uh, here it is being relocated with a bigger truck and a longer barrack, uh, but still on the move. And so now if you go to the interpretive center, next slide, you can see um, that the, the entire interpretation of what was there during World War II is echoed in the form of the, of the center, which looks like three barrack buildings put together, um, and is surrounded by living farms and ranches where the barracks are in residence today. And part of the reason why we, why I am so eager to participate in this tonight is that I'd like to be able to identify even more barrack fragments out there. I'd like to know where they are and what they're doing and how thoroughly they might be disguised, how they're talked about and how they're valued. Uh, and we're going to be uh, discussing that tonight. Um, and so that's the end of my introduction. And now uh, let's get a little context. I'm going to turn this over to Rowen, who will talk about uh, the irrigation projects in the area. Okay. Am I, um, am I here? You are. You're not visible, but you're here. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hi. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to take over from now. To, oh, okay. Well, let's go back. So, um, all the pictures you just saw from from Eric were obviously of the land that was um, allotted for the Hart Mountain homesteaders. And I'm going to give you some back history about how that all came about in a, in a crash course history of the Shoshone Project, which you can see here in the photo um, covers. This is about 35 acres from Cody up to where it says Beaver Homestead. This was used in the one of the homesteads from the Garland Division, which was one of the first divisions of the homesteading. Um, Shoshone Project 
sort of became 1902 was sort of a big year for reclamation and um, the Shoshone Reclamation Project was sort of born out of the reclamation um, bureau and irrigation projects were known as reclamation projects. Um, the concept was that irrigation would reclaim the lands for human use. So starting with the dam, which you can see in this picture up here on the left, Buffalo Bill Dam, which was called Shoshone Dam at the time, it was changed in um, 19, oh, changed to Buffalo Bill's name um, in the 1940s. Um, biggest dam, but it gave the water, water was the key, irrigation was the key to these lands for, for Western settlement. And the only way to get them was to divert water into this acreage. And so the dam was a big part of the project. 1902 um, was also when the government gave two point, the Congress voted to give $2.5 million to this Shoshone project. There were 30 projects in the Western states at the time. So anyway, it started in 19, the first, uh, the building of the canal, the first canal, huge 30 mile canal was the Garland Division. And that started, um, you can sort of see up there in the top part near the Beaver Homestead, which was on the Garland Division, was in 1907, the settling of that around the Powell area. Um, there were um, successes and non-successes because water was difficult to irrigate. 10 years later, there was the um, West, the, the uh, Franny Deaver Division, which is up above that. And, um, so I'll get into that more, but we can see that they came um, below, the homesteaders came by train. This is turn of the century. And here you can see that little photo and we're gonna see in the next one now, which you can go to the next one where they are starting to irrigate water and um, well, there's the canal, there's the Garland Canal and the um, water in it on the left is building and the water in it on the right with some of the reclamation project. Um, uh, people on the top there. So the next slide is showing, yeah, that's showing some of the water difficult. There was a lot of, lot of failures with those homesteaders. Next slide, um, but a lot of success as well. Here's the other map where you can see up top was the Franny Deaver Division in 1917 um, during World War, uh, World War I, alkali, lots of struggles, but still they were, they, were, they were good and successful. Down below here, below Powell, is the Willwood Division, which was another 20 years later. And they had a little more fertile land. They had their own um, dam that was built in this intricate form of spider webs of dams and laterals and water was was um, an integral part of that. So that was 10 years later. And now we come to the big area here that was about, um, let's see, Garland Division was 33,000 acres. And so see that si uh, size wise. So Hart Mountain was about 40, 45,000 acres. And it had its own canal. And all of this plan, obviously the land, all of this was planned early in the century and um, without knowing that there was going to be the impact of World War II and then of course the Japanese American incarcerees coming to that land. They have their own canal from the Buffalo Bill Dam. They have um, their own canal which is the back of my talk right now. See that water there? That's not a river. That is the Heart Mountain Canal, which is the lifeblood of the Heart Mountain area, as the other canals were for the other homesteading divisions. Significant in that is that um, the building of the canal that starts just after the dam along the edge of that, um, let's see, it sort of looks like an I Dream of Genie shape, I guess. Um, that canal was significant one, because it was going to carry water to all of that acreage for homesteaders, but for, uh, two, the, the incarcerees did work on sections of that canal. And it's not just the water, it was a siphon, it was a tunnel, and then there were laterals that came from the edge of that on the left that were one of the laterals and one of the, it's called the Highland Canal. You can, um, next slide. We can, um, this canal here, those are Japanese um, American incarcerees there when the water came into one of the sections of the canal, 
because that water was going to irrigate their land once it was turned over to the war authority by the Bureau of Reclamation. And that was when they arrived, obviously, in 1942. I find that um, really a significant photo, just when water is coming in at all. Um, it's a big event, big deal. And here it's a, an event for the incarcerees, as it was down, there was prior for the homesteaders in their divisions and will become for the Heart Mountain homesteaders. To the right, you can see the farming that was happening at Heart Mountain when the incarcerators were there because of their skills, their knowledge, they brought expertise into the land, which the landscape was already starting to change. And here they were a part of the Heart Mountain land that would then become for the homesteaders. Okay, next slide. Um, for the Heart Mountain homesteaders, um, all divisions had to have a drawing, um, which was just a pure lottery and um, hand, names out of a hat. Here, this is more documented for 19, um, 1946, after the, um, in course, the in Japanese Americans left and war was over, then the homesteading division could open up um, to the two people. Um, bringing the westward expansion, westward settlement um, with the new, the land that was with water. This picture, these pictures are fascinating. Eric shared these with me and we have some at the Homesteader Museum where people are gathering and the names that are in the bowl um, ended up being about, uh, about two to 3,000, even though there were 10,000 inquiries for this um, for Heart Mountain homesteading after the war. A lot of interest, people wanted to come. Um, so you can see here the radio station, it was a big event. Okay, um, next slide. In the, um, after learning from the other homesteading units and divisions over the, the last 40 years, um, they learned that they needed to have more requirements for the homesteaders. So the Heart Mountain homesteading was set up more for some success. They had to make sure they had um, farming experience, $2,000 in the bank, and veterans were given um, preference. So you can see here that um, there's a sign that says veterans notice. The, the land that the barracks and the, the camp had been on and was turned over to become that for, for the veteran administration and for homesteading. Um, next slide, please. So once the drawings were done and, and hopeful veterans, um, oh, by the way, um, 10,000 inquiries, 3,000 actually applied, and then 274 or 75 were chosen, were, their names were drawn out of the, the bucket. And this family here is um, the Rochbuses, and they're standing there, you can see their number there. Um, which is significant as you'll see more down the road with Mary talking about the barracks. That was their number. They pulled that number out um, in their lottery and there they are in the barren snow um, waiting to imagine what their homestead was going to be like. Um, next slide, please. I forgot to mention um, that that also in the as along along with the requirements for home, Heart Mountain homesteading, there was also the enticement. Um, I've gone way past my notes, but there was a quote, great quote about um, sweetening the deal for all the advertisement for homesteading for Heart Mountain was that you would get two barracks to be able, as Eric said, to be part of your building blocks to start your home. These are two pictures of the canal. Um, the one on the left is just a lateral that comes off the main canal. And that picture right there is um, part of the canal that's on the opposite side of the picture that you see behind me. Okay, next slide, please. All right, you're gonna see more about the, with these photos from Mary, but here are some of the, the struggles, um, the excitement of getting a barrack, but then the struggles of having to move them um, Eric also showed some photos of that, cutting them in half. Picture down below here is a, a family I got to know pretty well at the Homesteader. Um, it was a Harley Bright family. 
there's kind of a man sort of standing there, which was his brother-in-law, standing a little movie starish. Um, movie, a lot of uh, a lot of Harry Harley Bright's photos were all very proud. Here we are. Um, Harley was from Colorado, also a veteran. Um, and this they say here before they closed in, and you'll see from Mary what more of that means. Next slide, please. Um, here we have a couple of the um, the the uh, Franks. I think were in this photo. Planting trees was a huge thing, obviously, on all of the project all, of all of the divisions on um, in the Bar Bighorn Basin because it was barren. But what I find striking about these two, obviously, is here the homesteaders are, and on the left there's there's several barracks um, in one place, almost like its own little its own little not camp, but a little group, as well as the ones here. And, you know, there's so many with the barracks that are so clearly barracks, even though they've been cut in half, obviously, in both of these. All right, next next slide, please. Here's just some irrigation photos of um, one is the, the with the piping here, also on the right with the piping here, you get a good sense about, about how the water comes from the irrigation on Heart Mountain. Next photo, please. And here we're gonna see a few more of, that's actually another family, um, Claire White. Another family I got to know really well, Bill was her husband. He was from the um, uh, World War II veteran from the Bataan Death March. And just a, a, a lovely family. Again, the barracks in the background, not a whole lot had been done to these, these particular barracks at the time in 1950 when the last of the Heart Mountain homesteading happened in terms of their drawings. Next, next photo, please. And then here is another family, um, the Krauss family, and um, visiting the Bright Homestead, which is Harley again. And again, you can see behind them the um, the barracks that looks like maybe Eric has that been cut, that hasn't been cut in half yet, or part of it has. It's a, it's pretty long. Yes, I can't hear him, but whatever he's saying, um, it's not as long as they were, so maybe a portion of it has. Okay, the next photo, please. And this is the last photo. Um, this is a woman, her name is Ellen um, Adams. She actually was a volunteer at the museum, and she was part of the Heart Mountain homesteading. And this photo struck me, as all of them do, um, as such a juxtaposition between the Japanese American incarcerees who came to Heart Mountain, to the land, um, adapted the landscape for them, changing it and getting it ready for the homesteaders. And here, homesteading family here, this young girl smiling, and the, the barrack right behind her not really changed very much with a very different um, a very different symbol for those homesteaders as it was for the incarcerees. Um, they both made the best of it, but I'll let Mary um, go and talk about more about the barracks and our project, which was the exhibit that we did that is in Laramie as well, and all of us did together. So maybe you'll have questions. Was that 10 minutes? <laughs> Okay, um, I'm going to focus on the barracks themselves. And um, the definition of a barrack is a building that is hastily built, often to house soldiers, and it's temporary. And it was said that a barrack at Heart Mountain could be built in 59 minutes. So that's definitely a hastily built building. So how does a simple building like this a temporary building becomes significant. And that's what um, my little piece of this presentation is all about. Next slide. So you can think of uh, buildings uh, besides just being dwellings or shelters. They're also artifacts, just like artifacts in a museum. And so buildings represent a period of history uh, they provide clues as to how people lived at a certain time during a certain period. They represent broad themes in human culture, as well as personal experience. And they uh, are very strong artifacts in terms of evoking memories 
and uh, spurring uh, wonderful stories. So in terms of just history, the Heart Mountain Barracks represent the US government's reaction response to the bombing of Pearl Harbor and uh, the decision of the government to imprison Japanese uh, American citizen. And the barracks themselves then are the government's solution to how to house these citizens once they have uh, decided to round them up. Um, but the significance of the barracks goes far beyond that. Next slide. Uh, we're fortunate to have uh, wonderful photographs, uh, stories, books, artwork, oral histories, uh, so many sources, as well as the barracks ourselves, that um, give us a sense of what life was like uh, for the families who moved into these barracks. And so these buildings are 120 feet long and only 20 feet wide. And they were divided into six units. And so each family, a family, generally just had one room. So you'd have a whole family living together in this very, very small space. Next, please. And uh, what is really fascinating in terms of, of human nature and human culture is the way that eventually the uh, Japanese Americans who were forced to come to this desolate place and live in these temporary, um, quickly built buildings uh, adapted them and made them homes. And uh, this one is particularly interesting because uh, this is such a typical traditional Japanese uh, interior with the, the post in the corner that symbolizes, represents uh, strength. Uh, there's the family altar, there's a scroll on the wall, the flower arrangements, the low table, the tea kettle, uh, just all of it is, is straight from a, a, you know, it is a traditional uh, Japanese space. And uh, very interesting about this particular photo is uh, the man pictured here was not only a US citizen, but he was a US um, vet. He served the United States in World War I um, and then was imprisoned by the United States in World War II. Next slide. And this is a very different interior. This is one that looks um, definitely more Western um, with the flowered curtains and the bedspreads and furniture that was Western, is Western in style, um, undoubtedly made at Heart Mountain, uh, the decorations on the walls and so on. I love the, the touch of the tights hanging in the corner there. Uh, but this really gives a sense of uh, this is a this is a home. This is a place where people lived, and they they you know did their best to to make it homey and and comfortable. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, besides being uh, historical artifacts, of course, to the former incarcerees and to their uh, descendants, these barracks are a very personal reminder of their lives as prisoners and the hardships that they endured. So again, the, the memories that these buildings hold and the, the stories that they hold are very, very powerful. Next slide. But as you have heard from previous speakers, the Heart Mountain Barracks have a second story to tell. And um, the federal government found a really good way after they closed the Heart Mountain camp to dispose of all of these buildings, and that was to offer them up to the homesteaders. So this ties the barrack, that uh, temporary building built in 59 minutes, to another big chapter in American history, which is homesteading. Um, so next slide. So this is another, I think this is another Harley Bright photo, uh, watering the trees. Um, so these buildings represent not only the imprisonment of Japanese Americans during World War II, but also the post-war homesteaders and their efforts to transform this barren land into a productive farm and to tr transform these 
hastily built very simple buildings into a home. Next. So, um, as we said, these buildings are very long, 120 feet long, and in order to transport them, well, first of all, in order to get a barrack, you could get a barrack for a dollar, you could get two for a dollar each, but uh, you had to remove them yourself. So um, they generally had to be sawn in half. So here's uh, one of the homesteaders sawing his barrack in half. Um, also pictured here is uh, a barrack that we found that where the two halves have been put back together, kind of just shoved up next to each other. Next. And then um, I, we really like the moving photos. They're so dramatic. Um, but so then, of course, the barrack had to be moved out to the homestead. And next slide. And then the homesteader had to figure out how to make them the barracks uh, into a home. Uh, next, please. So uh, there are um, many different configurations, and I think it's really shows the um, creativity and, and of the homesteaders in that they took these rectangular buildings and they cut them up in various ways and they created uh, their own individual uh, homestead. And so this, again, these buildings reflect a particular cultural, uh, culture, cultural traditions. And um, it's, it's just fascinating to see the different ways, whether it's, there are a lot of L-shaped houses, uh, some with a little section that juts out and um, some barracks made into two garages and so forth. Next slide. And a couple of interiors. Uh, this is Mildred Van Dyke and her kids uh, in their barrack homestead kitchen. Uh, this was taken about 1950. Next slide. And uh, here's one that, that we took doing field work uh, about 60 years later. And um, this is on the, um, oh, the Winters homestead. Um, next slide. <clears throat> so um, I don't think anyone has mentioned yet that the University of um, Wyoming American Studies program undertook a project uh, in cooperation with Rowing and the Homesteader Museum to document over a period of several years as many of these barracks as uh, we could in the uh, Powell and Cody area. And uh, so try to identify the barracks, to um, interview the owners where possible, and record the different ways that they were configured, the different ways that they were used. Um, and so we collected this information and in 2012 had an exhibit at the Homestead, Homesteader Museum um, called Heart Mountain Barracks Revisited. And uh, this exhibit is now um, up in the uh, co-library. I think Andrea can give you specific directions to where you can see it if you're in Laramie. Um, <clears throat> but today, these barracks, these, these simple temporary buildings are found all over the Powell and Cody area and beyond. And they create a cultural landscape that's really unlike any other in the state and maybe in the country uh, because they represent in a very powerful way um, what was going on in mid 20th century America, the uh, United States. I mean, two very, very important historical events and trends, homesteading, lots of people after the war moving west. Uh, so it's a, it's a really fascinating landscape. And uh, documenting the Heart Mountain Barracks in their many forms helps us to understand that landscape and to tell the stories behind these buildings. Next slide. So barracks are recognizable, first of all, 
for their overall form and dimensions. So you could find they're always 20 feet wide and they might be, you know, generally come in, in sort of 60 foot segments, although they may, might be uh, shorter than that if they've been cut in a certain way, but they all have that low pitched gable roof. Uh, the eaves are cropped, so the roof line doesn't extend very far uh, past the wall. So you, you, you recognize them mostly by this shape. Um, next slide. But there are also specific features of the, the barracks as they were built at Hart Mountain. Uh, for instance, the five panel wood door, that's an original uh, Hart Mountain barrack door. And you still see a lot of these on the, the barracks in this area. The windows were uh, nine pane, three over three windows. Uh, there was a light standard at the uh, gable end of, of every one of these buildings. And, uh, it's very rare, but occasionally you still see the original light. And uh, then there were chimneys, uh, so six units, uh, two, oh, go back, just, uh, just to point out that you can see a little stub of a chimney on the, the um, image in the upper left. And so there would be three chimneys in the 120 foot uh, barracks. So sometimes you can see that little brick chimney and that helps to give it away. Next. So once you begin to recognize this form, you start to see it everywhere. And um, it's kind of like anytime you're looking at buildings in the landscape, you're looking for something in particular, and then everything starts to look like that. Um, so you certainly around Powell, if you drive around, you will start saying, oh, that's got to be a barrack, that must be a barrack, and so forth. So here are just a few examples of some of the barracks we, we documented. Um, some homes, a couple of farm buildings. Uh, next slide. And uh, as Eric mentioned, they were put to good use uh, for farm buildings as well. So uh, barns ho uh, holding livestock, sheep, or or cows, um, sheds to sh store grain or hay, machine shops, uh, utility buildings, just any kind of, of use you might have on a farm or ranch, these uh, barracks could be adapted for. Next. Oh, there's one more example, a, a stable and tack room. Next. Now, the fact that uh, barracks built to house Japanese Americans in a prison camp were later used as homes by veterans of World War II, uh, many of whom likely fought against the Japanese in the war, brings up many questions about war and about justice and about guilt and, and all sorts of things. And uh, having oral interviews, which uh, we did quite a few of and other people have, have as well, uh, helps us to understand some of the, the personal sides of these issues and the personal stories about uh, living in one of these barracks. And although in many cases, the actual, um, this, this might be hard, this particular house, if you weren't looking for it, uh, to recognize this as a barrack. And in so many cases, uh, they have been quite well disguised. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in some cases, you still find uh, evidence of the original inhabitants of the, the barracks. And I'm going to end with this slide. It's, it's just one of my favorite things. This is something we, we I, I first saw when I was doing this Barn Again project in Pell um, on the Frank homestead. And uh, Mr. Frank showed me the inside of his barn and then uh, was sure to point out this cupboard that was built by a uh, Japanese American incarcerate, uh, handmade with leather hinges and a, a little uh, rope uh, draw on it. And um, he just felt like this was a really important a uh, historical art artifact in his barn and um, had made sure that it remained there. So um, 
I'm going to end with that. And I think Andrea is going to talk a little bit more about some of the things we learned through the oral histories. All right. Whoops. OK, so um, as a folklorist, I'm interested in the stories and the oral traditions and with so much of history, so much of it is not written down or documented in formal methods. And you have to talk to people and listen to people um, to get those stories. Um, so we got, um, and, and in this area of the state, everybody knows about the barracks. And so lots of people will say, oh, that was a barrack or this garage is a barrack. And sometimes they are and sometimes they aren't. And you'll have to look for the, the telltale signs that like Mary described, um, the proportions, the roof, all those kind of things. So this is, it's currently the Elks Lodge in Powell, but um, when we gave our presentation, when we had that exhibit opening at the Homesteader Museum, somebody told us this was originally an LDS church and that they had moved the barracks in and made it into a church and now it's, a, it's an Elks Lodge. So you wouldn't know that history. Um, we also um, heard about, and we mostly documented buildings in the farming, the homesteading area, but they were buildings that were moved into Powell and Cody into town. And we heard about somebody who has a house in Cody that supposedly was a barrack. So I got in touch with him and I said, is this and you know, what's the story? And he said, well, when we bought it, we were told that it was originally a barrack but they never really looked into it and they've made additions over the years and you know, you can't tell it was a barrack, but he said the original house was 1200 square feet. Well, that's a 60 by 20 half barrack. So it sounds to me like it probably was and they're, start, they're actually starting to research it. If the, if the date, you know, in the records show the house was moved in there in the late 40s, that's a good sign. Um, but they decided when they put these additions on, they would not mess with that original core of the house because like the little cabinet, they wanted to preserve it if it was a barrack. So I just love that story. Um, so as I said, you know, we had a, a student who did a couple work weeks of field work in the area and he lots of people told him this was a barrack, that was a barrack and he tried to go document all of them and many of them could be documented from some of these you know sometimes they still had the original windows and the proportions were right and some he said you know he was kind of skeptical that they were barracks but people that story is part of the community and people know that history so they keep telling that story and as a folklorist sometimes I'm not really concerned whether it's true whether it's factually true it's interesting to document you know was this actually a barrack but why do people tell those stories? Why do they want it to be a barrack? It's part of the, the history of the community. So they, those stories pass on. Um, and we, let me find my cursor. Um, so here's the Robertson house again that um, Mary showed. So the house is made up of a half uh, barracks put together. And then they also have this shed on right that was a, their second barrack that's a storage shed, machine shop, kind of an office space. Um, and so we interviewed Jane Robertson, whose parents were the homesteaders on this place. She wasn't actually born yet. She was born shortly after they, they moved here and established the farm. But she talked about the community of homesteaders. And she said some of them weren't that great at farmers. Rowene said they were supposed to have had farming experience to get the land. But apparently some of them maybe stretched the truth a little bit. Anyway, she said they, they all worked together one farmer would buy one piece of equipment and one would buy another and they would share and they would trade back and forth and they would help each other. And uh, she said, um, one quote is, it was a huge community effort to get all of this in production and get everybody farming. And she also said about the buildings, um, when I was a child, those were the only houses. I mean, if it wasn't a barrack house, it wasn't a house. That's what we all had because everybody was a homesteader and it was a long time before we had another house that somebody would build out here. So that sense of community and a lot of that is still there. A lot of the descendants of the original, a few original homesteaders are still alive. Um, this was 75 years ago. Um, 
and there are some of their descendants are still there. New people have moved in, but the stories about the barracks have been passed on in the community. Um, she also mentioned there was a building at the campsite. It wasn't a barrack, it was a smaller building, but it was used by the community as sort of a community hall. So there were 4-H meetings and women's club meetings and potlucks. And she remembered that building that was still on the original site of the camp. Um, there were also, I'd been doing research on community halls, and this is an exhibit in the Homesteader Museum that talks about there were lots of women's clubs that formed when the homesteaders came in because they, well, this was obviously earlier, um, as a way of for the community to gather. And a lot of them had buildings, clubhouses and community halls. And this one was a repurposed barrack. It's hard to see the, the shiny exhibit with the glass, but um, several of these women's club community halls were repurposed barracks. And there don't seem to be any left anymore. They were sold or um, they burned or something. So I don't think that there are any of those still left, but that's another part of the history of this valley. Um, there's also a long history, sorry, I keep losing my cursor, of um, moving buildings in Wyoming. You know, little um, one-room schoolhouses that maybe several ranchers got together and built a, a schoolhouse on one rancher's land, and they would have a teacher come in, and all the kids would go to that schoolhouse, and maybe when that rancher's kids grew up, they would move the schoolhouse to another rancher's land. Um, there's just, you know, there wasn't, there isn't much building material. If you have something, you're going to reuse it and repurpose it. Um, people didn't have a lot of money. So there's this long-standing tradition of moving buildings around. So this homesteader reuse of the barracks fits into that narrative. Um, and then we were contacted, I don't remember how, um, by a man in Thermopolis who said he used to live in a house in Thermopolis that was a former barrack that's what this house is. Um, so we stopped there on the way back from one of our field trips up there. And uh, he doesn't live in the house anymore, but he said that, you know, the core of this house was a barrack. And the man who, some, some man bought the barrack and moved it to Thermopolis, which is 100 miles from the camp, probably disassembled it to move it. I don't think you could move a whole barrack that far use part of it in this house and use the lumber from the rest of it in, in other houses. Um, and the man who, who we talked to said he, at one point he was remodeling this house and they did find evidence of um, that it was a barrack. It had one of the original windows which slid sideways um, and some of the original framing and, and they could tell that it was a barrack. He also said when he was working on it that he saw a small Asian man and his daughter also saw this person while they were working on the remnant of the barrack. And they thought it was the spirit of the person who had lived in this barrack at the camp. Um, that's folklore. Um, and they didn't, when they sold this house, they didn't tell the new people about that there was a ghost because they, they were afraid they would scare it off, scare them off. But I wonder if there are other stories about spirits in those barracks. We haven't asked about that, but I imagine there might be. <coughs> um, the same guy who moved this barrack also used, um, bought a bunch of what were called dam houses when the Bureau of, of Reclamation was building the Boysen Reservoir um, at the south end of uh, Wind River Canyon. Again, the, governor, the government built a bunch of these temporary houses to house the workers. And when the project was done, they sold off those buildings. So this same guy, bought a bunch of those buildings and moved them to Thermopolis. So there's, um, we also have a story, uh, Katie Christensen, who's helped organize this whole series, is from Encampment, and she was visiting down there and talked to a friend and found out that his house had been a building at one of the POW camps, World War II POW camps in Wyoming, of which there were several. So those buildings were reused. And again, they were temp supposedly temporary government buildings. So that there's a whole story of those kind of buildings in the state. And I don't know if anyone has researched, you know, what happened to all of those buildings and can you find them? And are there stories around them like there are in Heart Mountain about the barracks? <coughs> I just think that's a, a fascinating part of the state's history. Um, so just to conclude, um, 
if you talk to any of the Japanese Americans who were incarcerated at the camp, they can tell you like that, the exact address of their building. They were block numbers and then buildings and then apartments within the building. And they can rattle off 75 years later, they remember that address of their building. So here's a building that's being moved and it has those numbers on it. And um, likewise, sorry, I keep losing my, um, the homesteaders, as Rowen showed in her in one of her photos, the homesteads all had numbers, and those families have remembered and carried on that number of their historic, um, their homestead property. So there's another connection between the two, the two groups of people. Very different situations, but the buildings and the landscape they have in common. So that's. Um, end of my talk I just want to um, remind people there's a there's a book and a film called Moving Walls about these barracks and next week's program next Thursday the 15th um, we're going to be showing this film Sharon Yamato who's the filmmaker and Stan Honda who's the photographer will be there talking about their work um, documenting these communities both the Japanese American story and the homesteader story. So we hope you can join us for that. And I'm going to close this out. And if everybody can turn their cameras back on, there's Mary uh, and their microphones. And I don't know if any of you all want to follow up or ask each other questions, or I'm sure we have questions coming in from the audience. Well, uh, there is a question of asking if we could talk a little bit about the attitude of the homesteaders towards the um, Japanese Americans. And I don't think that I can, but I'm hoping that other people can because I don't. Rem I didn't actually do a lot of um, oral interviews my, myself, but um, I. I have a lot of thoughts about this, but they're not based on anything but, you know, conjecture. So can someone else address that? Eric, do you want to? Eric, your um, speaker is off. That's too bad because I was going to ask you if you wanted to go first since you actually lived in the area. Well, it, it's, it, it seems to be that it's kind of a, um, it, it, Depending on who you talk to, there was quite a bit in the in the early days, especially from a family that I recall um, most importantly, the Blackburn family, um, who felt an amazing amount of kinship. There seemed to be quite a bit of um, respect and and you know empathy for um, for the situation and the incarceration and, and a lot in terms of being learned from that. And, and it wasn't that I ever heard negative things, but the lack of talk about it, I found interesting um, from, from a whole range of people that were both scholarly as well as the homestead and the homestead family, as if they didn't want to actually face it. And so the absence of it was as interesting to me as hearing about families like the Blackburn who incorporated, who wanted to get um, some kind of acknowledgement of, of what had happened there and, and owing something to, to the incarcerees versus we, you know, I don't, I don't want to think about it kind of thing. And Eric? Well, that, that yeah, and that, that tracks nationally as well, uh, in the sense that there was a long period of kind of willful forgetting on the, on the part of a lot of people until um, the mid 80s, basically. Um, there was a, an exhibit at the uh, National Museum of American History in 1987 that's celebrated the bicentennial of the Constitution. And um, it was the first, I, I think it's the first major retrospective on the incarceration experience during World War II. Shortly after that, Ronald Reagan signed um, 
a, a, a bill, sorry, a bill that uh, gave uh, survivors uh, acknowledgement through reparations. Um, and then it came into memory for the general population. Uh, here in Wyoming, um, about 20 years ago, maybe a little bit more, um, there was a movement to make a site that would document or commemorate what had happened during World War II. There were a variety of motives and varieties of memories. Um, and it all culminated in a remarkable event that's just etched in my mind, although the date escapes me. When the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center opened, there was a, a, a kind of grand opening celebration um, that brought together the Japanese American community, which had already had pilgrimages and sort of collected, had a sense of collective memory about this, with folks from the area, from Cody and Powell. Um, there was a, a a dinner that occurred where people from the area were seated together with former incarcerees. And just looking at what was going around and overhearing conversations, it struck me that this is the difficult part of living in a multicultural democracy. There's very different memories about what's significant and, and, and what's, uh, what should be remembered. There was a lot of hard work going on there. And I think um, it's to the credit of both populations that the site itself uh, has maintained a, a pretty hard-edged hard -edged interpretation that it strikes me that folks in the area more or less buy into to their credit. Um, I could be wrong about that, but uh, it just seems to me there's a lot of local support for this uh, for this interpretive center, and that's a really good sign. Yes, and continuing uh, to learn and to respect. I wondered if there was a parallel. I know um, that the uh, former incarcerees were reluctant to talk about their experience with their families, with their children, um, and it took a, a long time for them to start opening up and it took a lot of questions from descendants and and so forth and I wondered if there was a parallel with the homesteaders that they they didn't really want to talk about it they you know they got their building they were struggling they had their farm and then maybe later on um, maybe younger generations yeah uh, start asking questions about the barracks and uh, there was a question last week in um, your discussion, Eric, um, that somebody mentioned that, that her grandparents had homesteaded. And she, she in I can't remember the exact uh, phrasing of the question or, or comment, but she acknowledged some, some guilt about this and that, you know, they, they had actually taken this building that represented oppression and that's where her grandparents had lived. So that, that kind of got me thinking about this kind of generational shift. Mm -hmm. it, it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting question, or maybe it's not a question, more of a process. Um, the, the homesteading narrative, especially during the early years, fits pretty solidly into the template of Western expansion. There's a, there's a moment of predation uh, you start adapting the land to your use, you make a home, you have a family, things begin to prosper. I mean, there's, there's an arc to that that's, that's very familiar in other locations for people who settled from, west, from east to west. Uh, breaking through that and acknowledging people who were forced to settle from west to east and had to make their own homestead in a very different environment Right. That takes a mind shift that might require a generation uh, to, right. to make a connection. Well said. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I plagiarizing, had, uh, I'm plagiarizing Patty Limerick, a famous Western historian, who <laughs> hypothesized one time, what would it be like to think about settlement is happening from west to east instead of from east to west. How would that change the narrative of what America is? <laughs>
Andrea, you were going to say something? Oh, just uh, Dakota Russell, who's the director of the Heart Mountain, Heart Mountain Interpretive Center, talked to my class about a month ago about museum work in general, but about the center in particular, and talked about when it was established, the history of, um, you know, the former incarcerees started this movement to, to build that center and what was the reaction of the local people. And I think it has shifted, but he said at the time, a lot of people were like, oh, we don't want to dig up the past. And, you know, that was, that's old history and don't stir up trouble. And that was an early uh, sort of tendency among the local folks. And I think that has, it's definitely shifted. And the stories that went along with that sort of collective forgetting are really interesting too about what the smokestack represented and what went on in that root cellar and all kinds of crazy stories about uh, what it was like to have a concentration camp located near your community. There's a question about if any of the incarcerees stayed in Wyoming. Um, I know one of the veterans who got a homestead was Japanese American. I don't think he had been at Heart Mountain, but he moved into that community. Right, as, as several in, in the state, but not from Heart Mountain. Mm -hmm. that, that's a really interesting question. Um, it is. That has a very problematic answer. Um, because before the camps were imposed on the western states, there was a meeting with the governors of those states in Salt Lake City. Um, the camps were going to be put on federal land or federally controlled land. So the governors didn't have full say in what went on. But the Wyoming governor, uh, and this quotation has been verified, said, uh, if you send us these people and they stay, they're going to be swinging from the trees. Yes. And so the right. idea was that they would get out as soon as possible. Right. Uh, and the history of the relocation after the war, many of the, uh, many of the incarcerees went back to California and suffered greatly because they were dumped into trailer courts and not supported by a federal subsidy anymore. They were given $25 in the train ticket. Uh, that's the sorry history of the immediate post-war years. Another interesting part of it is that a lot of, a, a significant number of incarcerees headed in the other direction. And the Japanese American diaspora from the West Coast to the Midwest and even to the East owes a great debt to the incarceration during World War II. So if you find Japanese communities in Milwaukee uh, or in uh, near Seabrook Farms in New Jersey, um, they came from the end of the war. So there's a, a mass dispersal after the war. Very, very few people end up staying in Wyoming. There's also the interesting story of Japanese Americans who were already in the West when the war started, they were not incarcerated. Right. Sometimes I did some work in South Central Idaho near Minidoka, which was another one of the camps, and interviewed a Japanese farmer who had, was a teenager during the war. His family had come in. Again, they had an irrigation project. They brought in farmers, they needed workers. So his family had come and were living in the area. And here was this camp, you know, very close by, and he was not incarcerated. Um, there was some prejudice, although he said he was actually elected uh, president of his high school class, like right before the war. So it seemed like they were accepted in the community. And then apparently some parents complained and the school principal came to talk to his family and, and he just stepped down and said, I'm, I don't want to cause trouble and like resigned as president of the class. Um, but he had been chosen by his feder you know, fellow students. Mm -hmm. The same Americans who were incarcerating 
other Japanese Americans. I just thought that, I mean, that's a really complicated story. Wow. Um, um, we have a, an answer from April French. Um, thanks, April. She said, um, yes, very few stayed. She believed that the Ando family remained. And then Takogawa, who I forgot about, who was a homesteader, was not an incarcerate. Um, but right, the Ando family. And they're still... They're still there? Yeah, there's quite a few Andos. April, I think April might be able to say more about that. But. And one of um, Stan Hondo's photos in the Moving Wall exhibit is of Takogawa. Yes. Homesteader, yes. Japanese American homesteader. A tractor, I believe, too. There's a couple of. I yeah, suspect, I forgot about that. By way of background, that uh, the yes. Bureau of Reclamation land camps, the camps that were located on, on Bureau of Reclamation land, uh, were particularly good about saving their barracks and then using them because there were homesteader schemes that were ready to go right, more or less, right. when, the, when the war interrupted that. So if you were to go to Tule Lake, uh, you would find the same phenomenon where, where there, are, there are barrack fragments scattered all over the place because that was a Bureau of Reclamation project. Same thing for Minidoka. So, right. And I think those, those were the three big ones that were located on Bureau of Reclamation land. So we're, we have a, not a unique situation, but a minority of the sites of incarceration had, have retained their, their barracks and are distributed. And I know in from Topaz, the camp in Utah, I don't think that was Bureau of Reclamation, but um, there are some houses in Delta, which is the closest town that were barracks. And the, the Topaz Museum website has a driving tour and they'll put, that will take you to which of the houses in town were barracks. There are also a couple of buildings that were part of the of mess halls or the hospital, I think, pieces of the hospital that were reused. So there were some buildings that were reused from that camp as well. Do you guys see what um, Sharon wrote? I've forgotten about that, that the Wyoming laws were passed to prevent Japanese Americans from getting hunting licenses as a way of keeping them from staying. And she's saying, and, and that's what I was sort of thinking, the Andos were not incarcerated but I, 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 would, I would trust that Sharon may know that because of the deeper research that she's done. Well, one of the things I started thinking about doing this uh, when I was revisiting the Heart Mountain Barracks revisited, um, how many times as a his historic preservationist, I've been in the position of documenting or preserving a building that was supposed to be temporary. <laughs> You know, it's so interesting, like some of our most important buildings are these, what people thought of when they built them as kind of, you know, throwaway buildings. And, you know, in Wyoming, they think, you know, a beautiful school building is old when it's 30 years old and you should destroy it. And here we have these barracks that are, you know, 75 years old and still serving as people's homes. I just, I find that really fascinating. We have a little for the for the Quonset hut. Yeah, there are Quonset huts in uh, in, in Wyoming that, that are that are quite remarkable. I'm thinking of one in Riverton, for example, a big one. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions? And thanks a lot to April for your input on this because you're she's from a homesteading family in that right. area. Right. Yeah. Yeah. She mentioned um, one of the is it the Heart Mountain Club? The Heart Mountain Clubhouse was a barrack, um, and she mentioned another one that had burned down. So they were used for that for that purpose, but I don't think any of them are still still there. They no. burned down after the war as they caught on fire during the war. Um, each, each apartment had one stove. Um, and of course the wood was, you know, it was everywhere and it wasn't cured yet. And um, a lot of these barracks caught on fire. So the fire department was really active during the war. Oh, and wow. 
after the war, they continued to burn. Yeah. Hmm. It was a question for Rowen. Can you talk about Mr. White, who is the former Bataan prisoner? Yes. What, what would you like to know about him? <laughs> Just a little bit more. He, he was the sweetest, gentlest, just so, um, he just was a dear, gentle man um, for someone having to had experience, what he experienced in the war. He and his wife were um, from Chicago, so they, they had farming experience, but I can't quite recall if he, maybe he had stretched the truth a little bit, but I don't, I don't think so, because he, they were pretty successful. Again, like I had said, being set up for success with um, a little bit more resources than previous homesteaders. Um, his wife had been a secretary. I'm actually forgetting what his um, previous career was post or pre-war, but I just remember him being this, this deep soul and, and I was always really admiring and praising of that after all he had gone through. They had no children. Um, I think his his wife had a hard hard time, and there were some quotes I didn't read, but that's another time. But many quotes of the homesteader, especially the women, quoting what it was like to come to this barren, godforsaken sagebrush land, and that's all through those forty years. Um, and and several of the wives had a difficult time, but groups and clubs were formed with the, um, the state extension office, agricultural office to help keep them together, teaching them how to can and, and, and garden. And, and she, I, I kind of remember that she had had a little bit of a harder time. Um, that's about. There, there are, um, and Sharon has interviewed many times, Evelyn George, who has many stories about what it was like to be in, in a barrack during the, the 1950s where you had to go down to the camp um, to, to wash your clothes because it had a, a reliable source of water. This is before they got water to their houses. Um, well, and then there are stories of the homesteaders when they, they first came and they had to get the land ready and before they had moved the buildings, they lived in the barracks, still at the camp location. Several people told us stories about they were living in the exact same place that the Japanese Americans had lived. Right. And eating in mess halls and shared bathroom facilities. Um, someone reminded or mentioned that there was a new book out about homesteading in Wyoming. Um, I want to, knowing more about the Heart Mountain Homesteaders, quite a few copies of a book by a former um, uh, English professor at the, of Northwest College. And she wrote a book and interviewed all of the homestead women um, of the three different sections, the three different drawings. And those are available at the Homesteader Museum. And there's quite a few of them. So I don't know if you can buy them on Amazon, but you can buy them through the Homesteader Museum. And they're very interesting. They're like stream of conscious um, oral histories, but it is bound and 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 quite quite informing. Well, can I uh, uh, give a? Shameless promotion for the presentation that Mr. Heart Mountain Bacon Sakatani is going to make later on in October. Um, Bacon is a real pioneer in, in terms of uh, attaining recognition for the incarcerated incarceration site in Wyoming. I remember him coming through in the late 90s and giving a slide presentation of those color slides that were yes. in my presentation and in yes. Rowan's or Mary's or somebody else's. They're remarkable. There's a collection from the American Heritage Center. It blew me away. And at the end of the presentation, he said, um, Wyoming is the only state in the West that hasn't officially apologized. I want an apology and I want it now. <laughs> 
<laughs> and bacon is a force of nature. Uh, he got it. It took a while. Uh, every time I saw him, he grabbed me by the collar and said, Sandine, I want to talk to you. Bacon is about five feet zero. Um, I'm six, three-ish. And um, man, I had knelt before him. Um, so if you have a moment, uh, this is a man who knows everything that you'd ever want to know about Heart Mountain and it during the War Years, and there's plenty to know, let me tell you. Yeah, and that will be on the 29th. That's the last of our presentations, and he'll be here with Dakota Russell, the director of the Heart Mountain Foundation, and Aura Newland, who's a board member and has a family history from uh, from Heart Mountain. So that'll, that will be a great presentation. Also next week, Sharon and Stan talking about their work, photography, filmmaking interviews. We'll, we'll see the film. That's going to be their well, that, That's wonderful. I have yeah. two amazing people working on that project and it's, it's pretty powerful. So we hope you can continue to tune into this series. We've had a great time putting it together and um, this one, especially remembering um, the field work that we did. It started 10 years ago, <laughs> hard to believe, um, but we had a wonderful time and learned so much about the landscape and the people and the history in the Bighorn Basin. It's a wonderful project. And that exhibit that we did is in co-library on the, it's technically the third floor, but it's the second floor up in the hallway leading back to special collections. So that exhibit will be there through the month of October. And then of course, also the Moving Walls exhibit that started this whole thing, which is at the Art Museum. And that's Stan's photographs, more artistic photographs of the landscape and the people and the buildings. Ours was more of a documentary project, but they complement each other very well. So if you're in Laramie or coming through Laramie, the Art Museum exhibit will be up through January. Um, be sure and stop in and see those. Great. All right. Any other? And I, I guess you also mentioned, since I'm not at the museum anymore, um, that they're working on trying to get our exhibit online. Yes. Point. Yes. The barracks exhibit, we hope to have a digital version of the barracks exhibit that will be hosted either at the Homestead or Heart, Heart Mountain. Um, and we'll provide links to that when, when they get that up. They're digitizing all of that material. Yeah. Any closing thoughts? Any final questions? Maybe we have one. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Sharon. Okay, well, I guess that's it. Thanks, everybody. It's been a great reunion yes project yeah. and this is a code that uh, some students need um, to get credit for attending so that's what that QR code is but um, I think we'll just wrap it up and thanks very much and thanks everybody for your great questions and for your interest and this yeah. will be posted on the art museum's uh, YouTube page within a few days I think all right good to see you all Yes. Good to see you. Thanks for watching. Bye bye. Bye.